Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm here today with Bob Pepe. I was about to introduce Bob as a Napa Valley legend, which he is, but I think just saying that would be selling him short. He's done a multitude of other things, made wine all over the world and consulted all over the world. He's perhaps best known for founding a winery in Oakville, Robert Pepe Wines, with his dad in 1980. They sold it a while later, opening Bob up to a host of other winemaking opportunities. Thank you, Bob, for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. I mean, if you live long enough, you, you automatically be, you start getting that legendary status. I think that's a, the key is the longevity and nothing else. I said I've had fun working, I don't know about all over the world, but set, definitely the Southern Hemisphere in Chile and Argentina for well over 20 years. And then uh, as well, California I even made a little wine in Colorado and Texas uh, way back. So yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Your careers included, you know, you founded a winery, you've been winemaker, you know, head winemaker, you've consulted, you've got your own boutique label now. Um, what are the different challenges with all these sort of different hats you've worn? You know, I think the biggest challenge with the family winery, other than being a little green, I was smart enough to hire a winemaking consultant for the first number of years we had the winery. I, we knew what we were doing in the vineyard. We had had the vineyard for 15 years, uh, but I was lucky enough to hire Tony Soder, who I think is one of the best winemakers going still in the United States. Uh, and so he was the one that kind of, uh, he was my mentor. Uh, and that, and you know, the, the, the concerns there were, I knew that most of my family's money was tied up in the winery. So dad was a great uh, partner. He let me do whatever I wanted as long as I kept him in the loop. So it was a lot of fun. Going from that and working for somebody else was uh, for about four or five years, Stimson Lane oversaw concrete in Villa Mount Eden in Napa Valley. That was fun. On a, it was a different level, a different uh, production level. Um, we were hitting over 100,000 cases there for a couple, of, a couple of years. So that was fun from that standpoint. But what I've really enjoyed doing from 96 on is being a consulting winemaker. Uh, you can imagine if you really look if you really enjoy growing grapes, working in the vineyards, making wine, as a consultant, I don't have just one little vineyard that I'm playing with it or my family's vineyards or, or uh, the vineyards of two wineries, but I've got vineyards all over wherever I choose to make wine from or whether I choose to have a consulting business. The reason for the Southern Hemisphere, one of the downsides with uh, being a winemaker as opposed to possibly a brewer is that we only get one shot a year. Uh, where you can make as many batches of beer a year as you want. Uh, so your learning curve is slowed by the fact that 70 or 80% of what you're learning how to make wine happens during picking, during harvest, during you know, fermentation. So the, the idea, I had this idea, well, if I consulted in the Southern Hemisphere, I'd have two harvests a year. So I managed to back in 40 harvests in about 20 years down in uh, between Southern, uh, South America and North America. So that's been the joy of being being able to have clients down there where their harvest doesn't compete with ours. I'd love to make wine in, in Europe, but you'd be that would be the same time we're making wine in California. It'd be impossible to really get involved. So well unless you unless you clone yourself, Bob. Yeah, but I don't think that anybody wants to see that happen. <laughs> so. so one of the varieties that I think you're best known for working with is Sauvignon Blanc. And it's, it's a grape that's grown all over the world. It's made in so many different styles, grown on so many different sites. Do you think that um, many of the styles Sauvignon Blanc is made in are, are legitimate or are people kind of going a bit far afield with it with all the different uh, fermentation uh, methodologies and aging vessels that are being used for Sauvignon Blanc? What do you, what do you think is like sort of the true north for, for Sauvignon Blanc? You know, I think that's a good question. One, I think, Sauvignon Blanc is one of the varieties that's probably got the widest range of varietal character. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's got that herbal, grassy, some people almost liken it to cat piss quality style or fruit on one end of the spectrum. And then it's got that citrus, tropical fruit, guava uh, on the other end. And so it just, it's got just an amazing range. And I think the, the climate where it's, where it's being grown, the trellising system, what kind of uh, light exposure you have on the fruit, all makes a difference in what kind of flavors you're getting. And I think that that lends itself to different styles. I have styles that I like though. And I think uh, for a good example is New Zealand. 
is well known for its Sauvignon Blancs, and they've gotten some some. Uh, they they did really well in the United States and California, and there still are. To me, though, that's almost too one dimensional. It just jumps out of the glass and slaps you in the face. What I want in Sauvignon Blanc, I want a, a, as much of a complexity of fruit character as I can get, and we can do that by picking early, picking late, picking uh, with a little more leaf uh, sun exposure, a little less, and so you can get that range, even if you're picking from the same area. I don't know if I just answered your question or not there. Uh, mostly, yeah. I was just curious though. Um, so what you said about New Zealand is really sort of about the uh, growing conditions, I think. Do, right. uh, do you think there are stylistic choices the winemakers sometimes make with Sauvignon Blanc after the grapes are picked that sort of take it uh, too far afield from what it truly is? I think the worst thing I'd like to see is obvious oak on a Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that more than anything else. And I think there's still some Sauvignon Blancs, even at high end prices, that to me, the oak is too prominent. And I think there's some so much beautiful fruit to enjoy with, uh, with Sauvignon Blanc. It, it doesn't need it. Just show off the fruit. You know, and, and I think... Uh, you know, as far as Surlees, I've done some Surlees on Sauvignon Blanc and stainless steel drums, which I think gives it a nice creaminess. So you can get that, that oak aged creaminess from stainless steel drums on the leaves, which if you really want to take it a step further and fatten the mouthfeel a little bit, uh, we, I've done that. So. Without, as you said, without sort of hiding the fruit behind some oak. Right. Right. So, so with that, you know, we should probably jump into the first wine, which is not shockingly Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> Sauvignon Blancs we've got. First right. one is uh, Geyser Peak. So this is a new foray for me. I've been working with Quintessential Wines, which is a marketing and sales company. They sell my wine. I brought them Valentin Bianchi from Argentina. There, that was the first imported wine. They were, started selling back in the early 2000s. Uh, so I know them really well. I've known the father since he was a broker in the Midwest selling uh, my family's wine, Robert Pepe wine. But I, so I've been making a Two Angels wine for them for since 2003, started with Petite Syrah, and then we moved to Sauvignon Blanc when we found some wonderful Sauvignon Blanc in Lake County. Uh, that's where all the grapes are coming from, from Two Angels. But this is a brand new project for Quintessential. They purchased the Geyser Peak and Atlas Peak brands. Um, shortly before harvest this year, uh, in July, early August. And so we, we, we bought the, the brands, but we also bought the, the inventory that was on hand. And so this is the first one I've actually had a hand in for Geyser Peak. Uh, we had about four or five different components. We, we added a few of our own and uh, we just bottled this, some of it before, um, before harvest and we just finished bottling another 20,000 cases of it. I think this for the price point is, as nice of a Sauvignon Blanc, if that's what you're if you're looking for a Sauvignon Blanc that's uh, got some nice complexity of fruit, a nice crispness to it, this is this is the style I really like. You can sit down and enjoy it with food. This is actually California Appalachian. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And there is some there is a little Alexander Valley, a little uh, Sonoma County, but it's mostly um, from the Central Valley. Uh, a little bit from the foothills. Ah. So that's where we're getting most of it. Uh, Sonoma is the home of Geyser Peak and we're still, uh, there's other labels under the Geyser Peak umbrella that will be making Alexander Valley Cab and Sauvignon Blanc, but this is always gonna be a California. Cool, yeah, I see it's a, it's a very clean, crisp SB. So not a bad one for 14. No, not at all. So Geyser Peak is gonna be they got, it's going to be driven volume-wise by its California line and its uh, and Sauvignon Blanc at fifty thousand cases. What we bottled this year is probably over sixty percent of the production. We will be making a, a Cabernet, which we'll, we'll talk about later, and uh, uh, a Chardonnay also. Yeah, the Sauvignon Blanc's always, uh, I think, traditionally been the driver for the Geyser Peak brand, right? Yes, yes, definitely. So we're pleased with this first release under the quintessential umbrella. So. Great. And then we've got a second Sauvignon Blanc, Samuel Charles. So Samuel Charles is a wine I started making for uh, the quintessential team, the, Kre the Krebs family, uh, three or four years ago. And it started out with a, a, a Cabernet from Napa Valley from the sub-appellation uh, Oak Knoll. 
Uh, we've been making a, a Samuel Charles Oak Mill cab for four years now. But this the Sauvignon Blanc is this is the second vintage of the two uh, of the Samuel Charles Sauvignon Blanc. It's from the same uh, High Valley Appalachian as the Two Angels Sauvignon Blanc. We make it a little differently to give it some to make it stand out from the other a little bit. What are the differences um, in terms of methodology between this and the two angels Sauvignon Blanc? This one is typically picked a little late. It's, we picked we pick the, these two adjoining Sauvignon Blanc vineyards in High Valley Appalachian in Lake County. And these, these vineyards are at over 2000 feet elevation. And we pick some about 10, to, 10 days to two weeks before the others. And so we get a little more of that herbal grassy character on the first pick. We do some leaf thinning after that. We get more of the tropical fruit character. This one's got probably two thirds of the second picking and, and uh, a third of that first pick. And we still want a little bit of that. You get a little bit of that herbal character in the background, but it's mostly more driven by that citrus and tropical fruit character. Uh, is what I'm getting at. And we did a little Sir Lee's on this just to fatten the mouthfeel a little bit. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's got a lovely mouthfeel. I get a little minerality on the finish. Mm -hmm. but it's really crisp and there's a succulence to it when I'm drinking it that just um, sort of keeps pulling me back in and keep, keep sipping this. Mm -hmm. And I think that has got to do with a little bit of the Sir Lee's character, a little bit picking it later. So the alcohol is not huge. It still just hovers around 14, but, uh, but it kind of just gives you that nice weight as well as a Christmas. You can handle, it gives you both at the same time. So this and, is the, and this, you said, is the, the third vintage of this wine or just of the label altogether? This is the third vintage of this wine under the Samuel Charles label. Samuel Charles is uh, Dennis Krebs. Him and his father are co-owners of Quintessential. Two sons are Samuel and Charles, hence the Samuel Charles brand. Wow. Uh, named after the kids. So they're, and they're all hunters. So you can see if you see the label, it's, a, it's an elk. Uh, they've got a little ranch up in Oregon where there's abundant elk population, so. And then we'll move over to some red. And we've got Samuel Charles, uh, 2018 Reserve Red Blend. Correct, I thought this might be fun to try. There's two uh, Samuel Charles wines, uh, a, a cab from the Lodi area, and then this red blend from uh, North Coast, the, the hills, 2000 feet elevation levels in, in the North Coast of California. I. Uh, these are wines that uh, quintessential represents Ironstone Winery in the United States, it's their, their distributor. And yeah. so these come from their vineyards and, and the wines were pretty much put together by them, but I've uh, overseen them to some degree. Uh, this has been a, a nice blend. This is uh, again, uh, from the foothills. No, this, this is from the Lodi area, from a really one of the cooler areas, river, river location, nice uh, uh, airflow through it, so cooler nights. And I think it's a blend of 50%, uh, what do we have in here? It's 50% Zinfandel, 40% Merlot, and the balance uh, Petit Syrah. So it's a nice kind of California blend. Um, we, yeah. want it to be, we want it to be, out there be, to be some nice fruit, which I think there is, but nice body also. So it's, you know, it's, it's easily a medium body to a bigger body red wine. I've noticed uh, very recently, and I don't, I don't know if I've tasted enough of them to call, say it's a trend, but I've had a handful of California and Washington State blends of late that, um, unlike a lot of the red blends that we've been seeing over the last decade or so, are not these syrupy sweet red blends. They're more like this. They're fruity, but they've got good acid, decent structure and they're gonna go with food. Do you think things are uh, moving a little bit in that direction or are these just a handful of random wines I've tasted that don't really tell a greater story? I think people are moving back in that direction. I think we're getting tired of the, the sweet wines. I mean, there were some, you know, there's a 60 and $70 bottles of wine. These aren't all the, you know, 15 to $20 range, these sicky sweet over, over, overdone wines. I mean, there's some expensive wines that are that way too. And I think people are moving back a little bit. I mean, this is a wine that's, you know, it's relatively dry, so it's not it's not relying on sugar to give you that that fruit character. It's just got some nice. These varieties work really well together, uh, and where they're grown in the in the, in the Lodi area is helpful too because it's one of the cooler areas and a good good airflow. Um, but I think I think that's kind of a trend. You're seeing people backing off. It's just uh, all the wines start tasting the same. 
uh, when you're when you're picking them over ripe, you're you're uh, they're not finishing fermentation, so they're somewhat sweet. You're really not getting the true varietal character. So. Yeah, absolutely, and that, and that's certainly you know true of the blends. It's true in Napa. I think of quite a few Cabernets. Certainly, Zinfandel can fall victim to that when they're you know just big and boisterous. But yeah, this is really lovely. Thank you. Speaking of Cabernet Sauvignon, yes, uh, eponymous, 2017 Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Yes. So this is this is your label. And, this is my uh, label. Um, so ever, <laughs> there's no really good reason for making my own label. I did that with my dad. He allowed me to have the opportunity to do that. It was great. But I'm having more fun as a consultant. But it was something that every once in a while I stumble across a vineyard that I really kind of eye and think, Jesus, you make some great wines. I'd love to try playing with these grapes. I get a lot of that with my clients, but every once in a while. So this was a neighbor's vineyard where I was living uh, for some time as a uh, the original vineyard in 2000 when I started it was uh, bench lands of Atlas Peak, so not high enough to be in the Atlas Peak Appalachian, but kind of the bench lands about two or 300 feet above the Silverado Trail. Just rocky, steeply terraced vineyard uh, and just tremendous big structured want fruit. Still getting a little from that area, but I'm switching a little bit now. Most of this vintage, I would say the biggest percent, about 35% is from Mount Veter. Starting to get some in this vintage from Coombsville up at around 1,500, 1,800 feet elevation. And then uh, from a couple other vineyards, but more and more, more of it, a little bit from Howell Mountain. My first Howell Mountain cab is in this one. So it's always been 100% cab. Uh, the original vineyard, I was blending different, different clones from different exposures. And now I'm blending just cab from different parts of the Napa Valley and, and leaning more toward probably 60% of this is hillside above 1800 feet elevation yes yeah, so, so for hillside and above fruit cabernet sauvignon it's it's interesting at only three years old how incredibly approachable it is it, it, it doesn't um it doesn't have that rugged uh taste that often would be associated with you know mountain or hillside cabernet sauvignon is that a due to That's your picking choices it's picking choices is what we're doing in the winery it's the the the, the the vineyards I've, 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 I've identified. Uh, it's just winemaking style. I mean, I don't, I don't try, I know this is gonna be a big body cab. I just don't want it, I mean, I want it to be approachable. And I think that there's ways of making wine that are balanced when they're released. You know, it used to be back when I started making wine in 1980, uh, if you looked at some of the wines that were made in the seventies, especially from the mountains, they were just huge wines. And they tell you, well, you just put it away for four or five years and it'll soften. Well, you know, if a wine's not balanced when it's released, if you can't taste some fruit when it's released, it's never going to be there. Because the tannins may be falling out, but the fruit's falling out just as fast as the tannins. So I, I do this by how I pick. I want the, the skins to soften when you're chewing them on your mouth. And, and that to me is the key to picking as well as the flavors. Uh, as long as I've got enough fruit, then I usually pick a little bit sooner than most people would pick the same vineyards. And then it's, it's the fermentation temperatures. I typically press before dryness because that's when you're getting the harshest tannins. Uh, so I'm pleased with this. I think it's a classic Napa Valley cab that is approachable and certainly not a wimp by any stretch of the imagination. A classic Napa Valley cab, but it must be said classic Na Napa Valley cab in sort of the older school Napa Valley methodology, not the not the, the wines that some think of as classic Napa Valley Cab these days. I think we're heading back a little bit. I, I, I hope you're right. So, so question for you though about Cabernet, you know, you said you didn't have to make your own wine, have your own boutique label, you know, you're consulting for so many other people. So when you decided to do that, Cabernet because it's a passion, Cabernet because it's all around you because you're a Napa guy, why Cabernet? That's what my neighbor was growing and, and, and Napa Valley cab is king and even more so now than when I started in 1980. You can't even find Syrah to buy or Sangiovese to buy in Napa Valley anymore. It's wow. everything's being replanted. Even if it's not the right soil, it's being replanted to Cabernet. Uh, that, and I just wanted to make a, a, the first statement with the Cabernet. I've since been making a Pinot Noir from Anderson Valley. I finally found a vineyard there that I think makes them, but it's just a question of uh, but this is going to be my my mainstay, is the is the Napa Cab under under eponymous. 
This is a re truly a knockout for a three-year-old Cabernet at 60 bucks. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you that are as ignorant as I am, uh, I know you know, Gabe, but eponymous, I didn't know what to name the wine. Uh, I, you know, you wanted something meaningful. I couldn't use my own name because we sold, when we sold Robert Pepe Winery, we sold the brand. So it wasn't a non-compete. We just couldn't use the Robert Pepe brand. So I was thinking, and I was listening to my daughter who was in college at the time, and she was talking to my wife about this word and listening. And I was saying, I think I can use that. So for those of you, I didn't know what it meant before I put it, six months before I put it on the label, but it means something named after someone or something. So the eponymous winery of Robert Mondavi is the Robert Mondavi winery. Uh, the upon Joe's bar is the eponymous bar of some guy named Joe. So I thought it was fun. So this is a wine made by a winemaker, the little play on words that cannot use his own name on his own bottle of wine. Hence the name eponymous and a little shadowy figure on the front label walking away from his name. So hopefully you have some fun with it while you're drinking it. So. It's a it's a perfect story that uh, also explains, you know, sort of your story where you came from in wine. Yes, yes definitely. So it, it's been a lot of fun. Not very profitable, but a lot of fun. <laughs> well, fun's important, too. Yes, it is. OK, so we've got Petit Syrah, Two Angels, which you, you referenced earlier. Uh, there is also Sauvignon Blanc. Yes. One of the quintessential uh, house brands. Uh, that you've been making for how many quite a few years now right i think 2003 was the first year for petit syrah we finally found a vineyard up there they wanted to do something with syrah petit syrah we found a petit syrah vineyard and this was up at i want to say 2200 2300 feet i think the highest elevation in high valley steep really steeply terraced vineyard the original one we had to change areas about five years ago because we wanted to make more petite and they didn't have more for us. So we changed to Red Hills. So this is, I think, the second, third uh, vintage from Red Hills, still in Lake County, uh, only about a thousand feet elevation versus the 2000, but really red volcanic soils. Half of it comes from the top of, a well, I should say half of it's about a thousand feet. The other half is on the top of a val an extinct volcano which is probably a good 1800 feet high. Uh, so we're getting two from Red Hills, but the real red soils are the lower elevation vineyards. On a sunny day, you walk through, into the vineyard and you just see, it looks like shards of glass illuminating the sunlight. And what it is is, uh, oh God, onyx, the, the, black, the black stone. Oh yeah, uh-huh. And it's, there was boulders of it when they cleared the vineyard three, four feet in diameter. And so these are little chips of this that are just reflecting the sunlight. Again, a, a volcanic uh, residue as well as the red soils. But really the, the Petit Syrah has been a lot of fun for me, both when we were making it from High Valley and also Red Hills. Like any good Petit Syrah, you know, the Italians used to call it Petisera. That was a homemade wine they made. And it was because they loved it because it just gave up color and flavor without with just looking at it. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to get some amazing structure from the Petit Syrah. So one of the things I did differently, I knew I was going to get plenty of color. I knew I wouldn't have any problem with fruit and body, but I just wanted to keep the tannins a little bit restrained. And so I started with the first vintage, I started pressing it two thirds of the way through fermentation. I had all the color, I had the flavor, and I had plenty of tannins. And by doing that, you don't get those harsher tannins extracting from the skin that you do that last third of fermentation. And so I think this is not only a, a wine that you can really enjoy the fruit, and if you like big wines, it's certainly no wimp, but by the same token, the tannins are relatively restrained and approachable. The, very approachable. Um, you know, the first thing that hit me sipping this one, uh, you know, I've had this particular wine many times before, not this vintage. The, the acidity is, is so firm. It, it runs right through it. Um, it's got great structure, lots of fruit, but it's not... I mean, yeah, you said it's big. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's bigger than a, you know, a, a lighter wine, but it's not a big, you know, what some people think of as, as some petite Syrahs. And I, I don't know, I'm curious, how long do you think this will age stored properly? I think it's going to age seven, eight years easily. I mean, I've tasted some of these petite Syrahs from two ages back seven, eight years, and they're, they, they're going to lose a, a little bit of fruit, obviously, but they're going to gain a little bit of complexity. And they're still a bright, youthful color. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I love Petit Syrah when they get older, when they when that the secondary and tertiary characters come out, you know, that earthiness that often becomes part of the game. 
I, I don't know. It's a, it's a grape that uh, fascinates me. Have you worked with much Petit Syrah outside of making this Two Angels one? I worked with a really nice uh, Petit Syrah when I was consulting for Rutherford Grove. It's now the Stoney family. In Rutherford, and they were getting some from um, right across the creek from Spotswood's Cab. They had some Petit Syrah growing, which was pretty spectacular, but the soils were just amazing soils. So we, I, I played with Petit Syrah there, and that's, those are the two main Petit Syrahs I've, I've worked with. Yeah, you know, you, me you mentioned how Cab is king, and this is, you know, Petit Syrah is, of course, one of the things that so much of it has been ripped out in Napa Valley at, at the expense of planting a lot more Cabernet Sauvignon. I get it, the, the money, but uh, it, it's a shame all those old head trained Petit vines. The head trained Petit, no more head, very little, if any, head trained Zin. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we've lost that. I mean, it's hard for, to tell a grower to plant something besides Cab because he can make twice as much money, dollars per ton with Cab than almost any other variety. Uh, but not all the, the vineyards in, or land in Napa Valley is suitable to make great cow. And some of the other varieties would have done better. Good. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Please, uh, thank you for taking the time to allow me to go through some of the wines I'm proud of and, and continue to be making for a while to come.